Welcome to Atmospheric Tales, a podcast that amplifies stories and experiences related to air pollution and climate change from around the world. I'm your host Shahzad Ghani and welcome to another episode of Atmospheric Tales. Our guest today is the energy coordinator at the NGO CEE Bankwash Network. She joined Bankwatch in 2014 as the coordinator of the Balkans Beyond Coal campaign, preventing new coal capacities from being built in the Western Balkans region. She works closely with the member groups and partners from Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro and Macedonia, offering support to the national campaigns while also advocating for stricter environmental regional policies. Prior to joining Bankwatch, she covered nuclear and energy development in Romania and Bulgaria. and followed the international climate change negotiations she has a degree in journalism but has been an environmental campaigner much longer than she has been a journalist i am excited to welcome our guest yoana chuta our interviewer today is teodora stoyanova who is an associate at the european climate foundation she supports the work on coal exit energy transition and communication in the southeast europe region with a focus on bulgaria Prior to joining the European Climate Foundation, Teodora worked as a climate and energy campaigner for Greenpeace Bulgaria, where she led the work on coal, renewables and air quality. Teodora holds a master's degree in environmental management from the Yale School of Environment with a focus on finance and energy. In her spare time, she is part of a small group of enthusiasts who develop out of the box creative solutions and projects for improving the urban environment and infrastructure in an environmental friendly way. Teodora is based in Varna, Bulgaria. Welcome to the show, Joanna and Theodora. Thank you, Shahzad. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I would like to welcome Joanna. And I'm looking forward to have a really fruitful conversation with her today. Thanks very much. I'm happy to be here. I would like to start with uh, giving our audience a bit of a background information on the region's energy perspective. We are talking here about the southeastern region in Europe, where the countries are characterized by rather old and emission-intensive coal-fired power plants, and predominantly with state-owned energy supply monopolies. According to a recent study by Agora Energy Vende, lignite plays a significant role in the power system of the region, and the production is being close to the level of production. action in Germany. However, we are witnessing a shift in recent years, and I would like to ask Ivana to tell us a little bit more about how things have changed in the region both for the EU member states and the countries from the Western Balkans, and what are the biggest drivers of this change? Yeah, indeed, we do see signs of a shift in the region. I'll just start with the Western Balkan region because that's where I am more present even though I'm physically present in Romania. and the work covers western balkans so we've come from a situation where just 3 years ago all the western balkan countries except albania which doesn't have any coal of its own so all five western balkan countries were still planning to build new coal power plants since then three out of the five have abandoned these plans which is great but we also see that the region has somehow split and it's creating a two speed energy transition We have on the one hand Montenegro, North Macedonia and Albania which are clearly orienting themselves towards renewable energy and finally making some steps to diversify beyond hydropower which was the second most favorite source of energy in the region. These three countries have reached a stage where they see the benefits of the energy transition for themselves and they're moving forward. But I have to say that in the last year but more intense really in the last few months i see their attention seems to somehow have been sidetracked by the aggressive gas lobby that is ever present these days in the region and they're kind of following in this trap of gas as a transition fuel when it comes to other countries kosovo as well despite being almost totally coal dependent has a unique opportunity to change the Kosovo sea coal power project has dominated the country's plans for i don't know over a decade but the collapse of the project last year has finally opened up the space for our alternatives and then lastly we we have Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina who are obsessively pushing for new coal capacities they're pushing this to the extent to which they have actually put 
building new coal capacity in their NDC, so in their nationally determined contribution as a measure to reduce CO2. This is where the fight will have to be fought in the next couple of years most strongly. Then if we're looking at the Western Balkans neighbors, they're also accelerating with their transition. The first ones were Hungary and Greece to pledge a phase out for coal power by 2030, Hungary and Greece initially announced a coal phase out date by 2028, which has now been moved forward to 2025. And also recently, Romania confirmed the coal phase out date by 2032. Of course, we're not happy about the date. We believe that it can happen much sooner than that. But also, I think the most important lesson learned for the Western Balkan region is the fact that Greece made its announcement at a time when Ptolemaida 5 coal power plant was still being built. This should show the countries how risky it is to push ahead with major fossil fuel projects in spite of warning signals that we as NGOs have given and that the energy market has given and, and so on. So I think, yeah, this is where we are as a region. Like we like to say, <laughs> a few steps forward, hopefully less steps back than, than previously. What do you think are the biggest drivers for this change? How do you see the role of the European Union energy policies and climate ambitions and the impact these have on the declining role of coal, both for the EU member states and the Western Balkans countries? For the EU countries, definitely I see CO2 pricing playing a big role as driving these changes. To give an example from Romania, last year, the energy company, which is operating the country's lignite mines and coal power plants, took 200 million, 200 million euro loan just to pay its CO2 allowances under the emission trading scheme. The state was ready to give this money, uh, but this kind of aid is subject to scrutiny from the European Commission, which must analyze the legality of state aid. In the end, the loan was granted on the condition of adopting a decarbonization plan. That's how the companies actually got to the point of announcing closures of several mines and units at its coal power plants in the next couple of years. For the Western Balkans, I would say the change is driven more by the decrease in the availability of financing for coal projects. It's practically now only China and to a little extent Russia who are still lending. But also this is driven by some of the countries that I was mentioning earlier, like North Macedonia and Montenegro, their own ambitions for joining the EU and to align their policies and targets with those of the union and to actually seize the affordability of renewable technologies. Unfortunately, I must say that in the energy community, which is intergovernmental body, which brings together the immediate neighbors of the EU from the Western Balkans, Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia, with the aim of opening up the energy market of the EU to its neighbors. So it has a body of legislation of its own, which is transposed from the European legislation. So unfortunately, we see that in the energy community, the process of adopting the 2030 emission reduction targets and also the renewable targets, it's delayed very much. So it should have been ready in 2019 already. So we have this rather absurd situation in which countries of the Western Balkans are developing their national energy and climate plan. They are mandatory but they're designing them somehow in a vacuum because they set some targets on the national level, but there is no indication whether they really count towards the actual emission reductions that are needed on the regional level. So for now, we don't know what the regional effort should look like. And this is mostly something that the EU should be driving and something that we feel has not been a priority for the EU. And it should. Since you mentioned it earlier, uh, I would like to focus a little bit more on the financing side. And the organization that you are representing, Bankwatch, was established with the goal to monitor public finance institutions that are responsible for the hundreds of billions of investments across the globe. And some of the institutions that you as an organization are closely monitoring are the European Bank for the Reconstruction and Development, 
the European Investment Bank, and these are some of the biggest investors in the region. The European Investment Bank, for example, claims to be the European Union's climate bank, and it focuses its investment policies on achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Would you describe the role of these institutions in the region, and do you think that their investment policies help accelerate the transition of the countries in the region towards carbon neutrality, or they're not as active as they claim to be? Indeed. I mean, both the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the European Investment Bank have caught the message that putting their money into new coal is not a good bet. And it was actually a result of our own long term campaign, which resulted in virtually stopping finance for coal as early as 2013. Also, the European Investment Bank's new policy to stop lending to gas is also a great success. But here, when it comes to gas, there are not many other public banks which have followed their example as soon as they did with coal. So I would say that while coal is rather widely recognized as problematic, gas is more and more pushed as a transition fuel. And the EBRD, for instance, is quite ready to lend to some of these projects. And this approach is problematic because on the one hand, we have some countries of the Western Balkans which have no gas infrastructure and have hardly any gas in their energy mix. So this would mean in practice gasification of Montenegro and Kosovo, for example. And on the other hand, this is risky because it distracts from the already delayed investments in renewables. Also, when it comes to the EU and the funds that are going to the countries, for instance, through the instruments for pre-accession, Gas also features in the green agenda for the Western Balkans and in their economic and investment plan for the region. It's quite pushed by the commission. The national governments jumped on the topic immediately. And international financial institutions are also involved in almost every planned gas project in the Western Balkans, in North Macedonia, in Bosnia, and so on. So for now, mostly this consists in and technical support for studies and preparatory works. But the probability for continuous support through loans is quite high. We also see, for example, the EBRD is quite active in promoting energy transition in North Macedonia. I think this was their flagship project where they've supported the transformation of an old lignite mine into a solar farm in Oslo. There is increased interest from the public banks in the heating sector because this will be the next big fight. Decarbonizing the electricity sector is going relatively well. And by now, the science tells us that it's possible. But in the heating sector, this is a complete new challenge. So we see some projects that are being supported by the banks, albeit with not so creative solutions such as biomass or waste incineration, which, of course, we could never support. But we're working on this and we hope to be able to co-opt the banks into truly transformative and, and sustainable solution for district heating. We, we have some alternatives for two regions in Bosnia and in Montenegro. The involvement of the EBRD and the World Bank in the recently formed initiative for coal regions in transition in the Western Balkans and Ukraine, they're there. But the fact that there is no dedicated fund as the EU member states have. This makes it a bit less transparent. It's not clear who has the governance structure of any fund that would appear. We see a risk in the banks being approached separately by energy companies or by municipalities without actually involving the public and doing a proper bottom-up planning process as we would like to see. That's quite interesting. But talking about finance, and you mentioned it earlier, China plays a huge role in the region. And I would like to talk a little bit more about China in this case. And according to a recent study by the Center for the Study of Democracy, China has increased its economic footprint in Central and Eastern Europe on the back of large-scale infrastructure and energy projects. And its presence in the region has been undermining the quality of governance and the decarbonization targets of the region, particularly in the Western Balkans. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about the role of China in the climate and energy development in the region? You hinted about it a little bit earlier, but if you can tell us a little bit more in more details. There's a lot we could say about China, but I think the tagline is that China had a plan for the region for years, whereas the EU unfortunately has neglected the region. This is how we've come to the situation where Basically, China is the only potential financier of such coal projects. The EU is only waking up to the threat. So we have already Stanari coal power plant built in Bosnia-Herzegovina and put into operation three years ago. Kostolac B3 power plant in Serbia, which is being constructed as we speak. Of course, a lot of the plants are on hold and have been seriously delayed. But this is mostly because they were either prepared in a very unprofessional way. So it was easy to demonstrate a lot of the legal breaches, for example, on complying with emission limits or with state aid rules and so on. But China has already a good foothold in the region, not just in the energy sector. We're looking also at transport infrastructure I think a lot of people will be familiar with the case of the Barbolia motorway in Montenegro, which has brought the country on the edge of bankruptcy. There's a lot of road construction in most of the countries involved. And I think the EU is now trying to solve this issue through some mechanisms that are not clear to the public, not transparently communicated or even timely. Definitely communication with the Chinese side is now non-existing and there is no kind of comparison term between how we managed to to get our messages across to banks such as the EIB or the EBRD to what China is doing. So we're trying to improve a bit the situation by going into the legal aspects of the projects, which most of the times fall between the cracks. There's things like environmental impact assessment on the transboundary level that was never assessed before. So this is something that China should be sensitive to because the science has been there for ages. It's power of emissions in one country don't stay in that country forever. So I think the EU finally got the message that coal is bad, that China's involvement in coal is bad, but it's still catching its breath on trying to come up with a plan. Exactly. One of the the steps that the European Union recently announced on supporting their carbon neutrality goal is the introduction of carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is in this particular case will have a significant impact on the energy and industrial sectors in the Western Balkan countries that are not part of the European Union at this point. Do you think that such policies are kind of opening the doors to more Chinese investments in the region and kind of undermining your efforts in some way? No, I think this particular mechanism, this carbon border adjustment mechanism is a step in the right direction from the EU. We've been talking even in the EU member states ever since the emission trading scheme was put in place, we have been looking at carbon leakage and how neighboring countries which were not covered by the scheme could be producing and exporting products such as electricity is also a product to the region. So I think on conceptual level, this is a step in the right direction from the EU. The problem that I have with it is that it's going so slowly. We saw a draft. This policy is actually now out for consultation until I think mid-November. But the time frame that we're looking at is something around 2025, even going as late as 2030. And I mean, we have a problem now with emissions from coal power plants, and we have a problem now with EU importing electricity from the region, which is produced in totally different conditions than it is produced in the EU. There is no CO2 pricing. There is no compliance with emission limit standards. So it's a lot cheaper to produce in the Western Balkans. And obviously the EU benefits from that, but it also carries a large portion of the burden for the estimated deaths and illnesses that occur in the region and in the EU as well. 
We've recently witnessed extreme heat waves and floods and fires in all parts of Europe and also the southeastern Europe as well and some of the countries we are talking about. Against this background, you mentioned that coal is slowly going out of the door, but gas is creeping in. We don't see a lot of ambition in terms of investments in renewables, energy storage, batteries, smart grids, all solutions that can help us mitigate the negative impacts of climate change. Why do you think that is? And do you consider lack of financing as a major reason in this particular region? No, um, lack of financing, I don't think is an issue for the region. I remember once one of my colleagues from Bosnia told me he was in a meeting with a representative of the Chinese embassy there. And he was like, why don't you put this amount of money into renewables rather than into a coal project? And then the person in the embassy was like, well, no one ever asked for a renewables project. We've only been approached about a coal power plant. So I think one of the main issues is the lack of belief by energy companies, utilities, governments, even mainstream energy experts in the region. They don't believe in the ability of renewable energy to cover a substantial proportion of energy supply. And it's kind of coupled with the availability of domestic coal and no real community opposition to its exploitation. But then I also noticed in talking to some not necessarily national level decision makers, but I think they might be a bit more open. But in general, in the region, there is a bit of a failure to understand the changes and the speed at which changes are taking place in the EU's energy mix in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And they kind of outright deny the cold phase out happening in many countries. So this is kind of anecdotal, but I hear very often small countries like Montenegro, which only have one coal power plant. And they say, well, we won't shut our coal power plant before Germany or Poland do. The problem is that this kind of denial of coal phase out that I'm seeing in the region, the power plant in Montenegro is already operating illegally. It ran out of existing operating hours, which we're giving as a sort of derogation to comply with emission limits legislation. So it's like we will deny that coal phase out is actually happening and it is being planned already for five years in countries like Germany. The kind of attitude is, yeah, we'll we'll see when we have some money for, for instance, for just transition and after that we will start planning which is completely wrong that's like the recipe for failure for a transition process that we're putting all our efforts basically into turning it around and communicating to decision makers one of the other problems is that there is an assumption in the region that any surplus of electricity will be exported and every small country has this idea of being a net electricity exporter. Currently, only Bosnia is such. And for me, this is totally beyond my understanding. Why would you fear electricity trading so much? Because experience has shown like in Scandinavia, northern part of Europe, this is how the countries have managed to integrate more renewables by balancing their grids and by interconnections and trading between the countries. So this is really a barrier in the sense that everyone wants to cover their needs domestically and then exports. And obviously, this is not going well if everyone has the same plan. Yeah, I guess that's in the regional attitude and way of thinking. For the final part of our interview, I would like to focus a little bit more on air quality. And uh, a lot of your work focuses on air quality. You are one of the authors of the Comply or Close report that analyzes the pollution caused by coal power plants in the Western Balkans. Can you tell us a little bit more about the state of the air in the region, the role the energy sector plays in it, and why people in the region should worry about the air quality? Comply or Close is one of our trademark products that we've been doing in Bankwatch. This is the third edition of the report. I was saying earlier that we started working a lot more on existing coal power plants since 2018, when the Large Combustion Plants Directive entered into force. 
that was the date when the legislation entered force. But all the countries have been aware that this piece of legislation that requires coal power plants to drastically reduce their emission, this piece of legislation has been in the Energy Community Treaty since its inception in 2006. And they've had a lot of time to prepare and secure financing for otherwise rather costly equipment that reduces sulfur dioxide, for example. And for us, this year's edition of the report was really overwhelming because we added the public health component that we didn't have in the previous reports. So we were able to estimate how many deaths have occurred because of the non-compliance by the 18 coal power plants in the region. And the number is incredible. It's 12,000 deaths over these three years that have occurred in the Western Balkan region itself, in the EU countries, and as far as in regions in North Africa. So this figure for us was pretty shocking. And we were also looking into emissions related to the electricity that is exported from the region into the EU. And although the share of the electricity exported to the EU only makes up a tiny fraction of the consumption of electricity in the EU, so it's something like 0.3% in the entire consumption of electricity in the EU, the emissions related to this export the sulfur dioxide emissions, they're like half of the total emissions from the entire EU coal fleet. The entire EU coal fleet consists of 221 coal plants. So the numbers are huge. And we see, unfortunately, a kind of trend to take away the discussion from these big polluters and from the fact that they have legal requirements that they need to comply with to, for instance, district uh, or individual household heating or transport, something that is a lot more difficult to regulate, a lot more difficult to pin down. So then we're a bit stuck in this situation where the air is bad, people are dying, the can comply with whatever emission limits we have. And the EU, they're aware, but not moving as fast as we would like them to. For um, my last question, I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit more about two quite interesting projects that you are behind and you're among the brain power. These are the Wung Run and the PM Monitoring Device Project. Can you tell us a little bit more about them and why they're so important for your work on air quality in the region? Yeah, I'll start with the Air Pollution Monitoring Project, which we started, I think, in 2016. We were hearing a lot from the region, especially in the cold season, which is now coming. We were hearing complaints from communities that they have no idea what the situation is in their communities about the air quality because they can see it, they can smell it. The pollution is there undoubtedly, but there was no official information on how exactly how bad the situation really was. So we've come up with an idea to get a device that is normally used by the official air quality monitoring station. So it's quite a professional device to put it in one place for a month at a time and produce reports on air quality data. In some of the regions, they were able to confirm some things that our local campaigners were fearing. For example, we were able to see in some places a huge discrepancy between the daytime and nighttime emissions. So we were kind of, hmm, maybe the coal power plant is really turning its filters off at night to you know, save some electricity and no one can see it. And then we were also able to determine whether the pollution is coming from the stack itself or from associated facilities of the coal industry because we had to fight with this narrative that was at the time being pushed that new coal power plants will solve the problem of existing pollution from coal power plants and we were all the time saying pollution from coal power plants is not only about what comes out of the chimney it's also the lignite mine that is usually somewhere nearby the community. It's also how the ash is disposed. So with our machine, we were able to determine when we had some high peaks in particulate matter pollution, that this was actually coming from the ash disposal site or from the mine itself, which don't have any protective measures such as water sprinklers and so on. 
And this was, as I said, we started it in 2016. I think the campaign really caught on in the region and it encouraged many groups to start producing their independent air pollution monitoring devices and do all kinds of actions and kind of press their local authorities for more transparency on availability of data. The long run is supposed to be a trail running race. The initial idea behind it was to connect communities in two coal mining regions, either from the same country or neighboring countries, but with small distance between them, and actually provide self-exposure monitoring devices to the runners. So they would be able to track emissions live during their course to see exactly emissions from the mines or emissions from the ash disposal site that they would be running near to. The pandemic came in the end and the first edition of the race was indeed a mixed one. There was a small group who participated around the Bitola coal power plant in North Macedonia and they went ahead with the plan and had recordings of their exposure to air pollution. But many more participated internationally on the online event that we created. So we had in the end close to 70 runners from, I don't remember, maybe 14 different different countries, definitely on three continents. That's what I remember. So this year, we're doing only an online version of the long run on the 6th of November. It's the week of action during COP26. So this year, we're asking participants to run for 20.3 kilometers to mark the need for a coal phase out date by 2030. And hopefully next year, we can actually do a live race as it was originally (laughs) designed. Excellent. That sounds quite interesting. I would like to thank you for the time. And it was a really great pleasure to hear more about your work and what you've been doing in the region for the last several years. Thanks very much. With that, I would like to thank our guest, Ioana Chuta, and our interviewer, Teodora Stoyanova, for joining us on this episode of Atmospheric Tales. Thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and share.